Hello, my name is Dr. Jennifer K. Spear. I'm with Living Springs Veterinary Care in Bennett, Colorado. I have been a mixed animal rural practitioner for over 13 years, and during that time I've performed many equine surgical procedures. As a result of a relationship with Long Hope's Donkey Shelter, I have been fortunate enough to do over 60 jack castrations. During that time, we have developed a very successful procedure for castrating jacks. We wanna show you that today so we can provide you with a successful outcome on this castration procedure to make this easier for you, your clients, and of course, the jacks. Donkeys are not just small horses. Donkeys, otherwise known as burrows, um, are very different from horses. They metabolize different. Their stress level is different. Uh, because of that, the drugs and the drug dosages you give them is definitely different from a horse. They are also much more vascular than horses. So that comes into when we start actually doing the castration procedure, you'll see the different blood supply and why I tie off the spermatic cord in donkeys. So just to kind of go over, the instrumentation is extremely similar to what you're gonna use for an equine castration. I always start with steam sterilized instruments. I'm gonna transfer them to a cold sterile bucket, that's water and chlorhexidine solution. I always am gonna use sterile gloves, sterile suture. The suture that I choose to use is Ott Vicryl. Vicryl or Polysorb, you want a absorbable suture. I choose to use a braided suture. You can absolutely use a monofilament in this procedure if you would like to. I choose to use a size 22 surgical blade. That's easier for me. You can certainly use a 10. I feel a 22 is gonna be easier. I have different sizes of emasculators based on the size of the donkey. We're probably going to use the medium size that I have with him today. So again, we're starting off steam sterile. We're going to go to a cold sterile. Here is my medium emasculators. Very standard emasculators with a cutting and a crimping. I'm going to go ahead and put that in my cold sterile bucket. I will have two different car malts. Doesn't matter if it's curved or straight, but you do want two pairs of car malts. Needle drivers, I prefer Olsen Hagers. You can use any standard needle driver you want. I go ahead and preload my scalpel blade onto my handle. Just makes it easier and less time consuming for me when we're actually castrating. I'm gonna go ahead and put my Vicryl in my bucket as well right now. I'm gonna go ahead and add my Chlorhex solution, turning this into a cold sterile procedure. I also want a towel in there and we'll use that towel later on during the procedure. So just to show you a couple different sizes of emasculators. These are obviously my larger emasculators. Probably no good reason to need this even on a standard jack, unless I have a mammoth, I would use that on. I also have a smaller version for my little guys, either your babies or your minis. Each of these packs has two car malts, one pair of Olsen hangers, one scalpel blade, and one towel. So smaller version. So why castrate a jack? Very important with these guys that we choose castration for them, not only to obviously decrease reproduction, it's also gonna decrease any sexual aggression they may have with other males, with genets, or with mares. Another difference with donkeys is they certainly take a little bit longer to descend their testicles. Can take up to two years for a donkey to have both testicles descend. You can have a crypt orchid in a donkey. It is rare, but not uncommon, so be aware of that. We don't wanna castrate them any younger than six months of age. 
Always be aware of your weather, your fly season, your environment when you're choosing to castrate. This is Diego. Diego is a five-year-old standard jack. We have weighed him. He's exactly 567 pounds. You can assume that a standard 48-inch donkey is going to be about 550 pounds. That's going to be very important to know when you're calculating out drug dosages for sedatives and anesthetics for them. Really important when we're choosing castration for him that we do a good physical exam on him. I want to talk to my clients. I want to know, has he had any illnesses lately? Does he have a cough, any diarrhea? I'm going to look, does he have any snots on his nose, any nasal discharge, any ocular discharge, um, any obvious problems, wounds, open wounds I'm seeing on him. I definitely want to go ahead and check out his mucous membranes. He's nice and pink, moist, capillary refill time, less than two seconds, that's perfect. I definitely want to go ahead, listen to his heart, auscultate heart, lungs, and gut sounds. I'm going to take a heart rate on him. His heart rate right now is at about 36 beats per minute, which is perfect. It's going to be very standard to your average horse. Auscultating his lungs. His respiratory rate's between about 12 and 16, which is extremely normal, again, standard for a horse as well. Sounds clear on both sides. I'm speeding this up for demonstration purposes. Obviously, if I was doing my full physical exam, I would be listening to all of his lung fields, not just this precursory scan of his dorso uh, caudal lung field. I want to auscultate all four quadrants of his abdomen. Sounds fantastic. So I've got heart rate, I've got a respiratory rate, his lungs sound clear, his heart sounds normal and good. Uh, ideally, when we had a, we would like to take a temperature on him. Um, donkeys don't really like that very much, so an effort to not get him too stressed, we're going to not take his temperature today. Another thing you want to do is you want to evaluate that he does have two testicles that are descended. He absolutely does. Both testicles are there. So we have a nice, healthy boy that we know has shown sexual aggression towards the other males in the herd as well as the other genets. Um, you can tell he has been in several fights. He's got an old bite wound right there. He's got some wounds here. This is a nice scar probably from a bite wound. So we know that as a five-year-old Jack, he's um, tried to display some aggression at some point and has had some aggression probably displayed on him as well. So castration is a, a perfect choice for him today. Let's talk about the common uh, medications and drugs we're going to be using for this procedure today. I always start my pre-sedative with xylazine. You can also hear this is called rompin. I use the 100 milligram per mil. The common drug dose you're going to hear about or read about in literature is 1.1 to 1.6 milligrams per kilogram. Okay, so we are going to, and I have several different needle sizes. I'll use a 20 or a 22, inch and a half to an inch. Really depends on the size of the jack um, and how old he is as well. The older he is, the more he's been fighting like our friend Diego out there, the thicker the skin's going to be, I'm going to want a sturdier needle. So we're going to give him a mig per kg of xylazine, and you'll see what that reaction does here just in a moment. We're going to wait for him to have a really nice reaction to that. The reaction I want to see is a very sleepy, sedated animal. Stumbling is okay. I need that head just about as low to the ground as it's going to go. I need a very quiet animal. If that dose does not make him quiet enough for you, go ahead and give him more, not a lot more, um, probably another 100 milligrams, 150 milligrams. Try and take the rest of that edge off, get that head down, get him nice and relaxed. When you have him nice and relaxed at that point, 
the next drugs we're going to give him are going to actually let him lay down to the ground. That's going to be the full-on anesthesia. We are laying him down today. We are not doing standing castrations. That's not fair to the animal. We're going to lay him down nice and gently. We're going to pick him back up when it's done. The drugs we're going to do that with is ketamine. Okay, Ketamine, obviously, again, um, a 10 hundred milligram per mil. Very simple, easy rule of thumb. Whatever you give for the xylazine, double the milliliters for the ketamine. For example, if you're going to give three milliliters or 300 milligrams of xylazine, give six milliliters of ketamine. Just double it. Make it very simple for you. I also choose to add on torbugesic, butorphanol, at 10 milligrams per milliliter. Um, I give that with my ketamine. Mainly, it's going to give me a smooth induction and a smooth recovery. Very important for these guys. Also, you know the torbugesic is going to help with some of the pain as well, more as, as um, an anti-inflammatory for him to keep him comfortable while we're doing this procedure. Combination of those drugs, as you're going to see in a moment, will allow him to be sleepy enough that I can lay him down. I'm going to lay him down gently on his side and they'll be able to proceed with the, with the castration procedure. I do use lidocaine, so you're going to see I am going to give a lidocaine injection into each testicle. I am going to try and aim that towards the spermatic cord as much as I can. The vasculature, again, more vascular than a horse, the highly vascular testicle is going to draw this ketamine, or I'm sorry, this lidocaine down through the spermatic cord. It's going to help them not want to suck that testicle back up into the abdomen, as you know many horses will do. Donkeys will do it too. So it'll relax that testicle, relax those muscles. The testicle will come out much smoother, and it'll be much less painful for him. After the procedure, some things you really want to be aware of. I absolutely want him to be current on his tetanus vaccine. He has to be current on tetanus. If he's not current on tetanus, he needs to get current today. I know for a fact that Long Hopes uh, vaccinates all of their animals as soon as they come off their quarantine process here on the property. I know Diego has already had a tetanus vaccine. I'm safe with that. If you're not sure about that, better to go ahead and give a tetanus vaccine than take their chance of him not having it. I always give an antibiotic injection. I'm going to choose today to give a penicillin injection, procaine penicillin G. My dose on penicillin is six cc's per hundred pounds. So label dose, you know, is one cc per hundred. That's not quite enough. We're going to go six cc's per hundred. One time dose is all you're going to need. I have some of my colleagues that are choosing to use Exceed for a longer duration of activity. That's totally fine. I feel like I'm comfortable giving one dose of penicillin for today. I have out this wound solution. You're going to see us use that. This is actually a, a special mixture that I have created myself. It's a uh, mixture of liquid nitrofurazone, scarlet oil, DMSO, and burrow solution, which is a combination of um, uh, cortisone and burrow solution. That's gonna, I'm going to use that you're going to see at the surgical procedure. I do all of my castrations open. I'm going to leave that scrotum open. I'm going to let that scrotum drain. So I'm actually going to put this in the scrotum. It's going to help those tissues seal up. Um, it's going to let them drain but keep them clean and not get infected. Okay, we've said that Diego is 567 pounds. We're going to go ahead and make that easy. Average him, again, average him at about 550 pounds. If you think about that, when you take that down to your kilograms, he's obviously going to be 250 kilograms. I said that for our xylazine, the initial dose can be anywhere between 1.1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Do that math if you want to do it on the calculator in your head, but that is going to be, I'm going to give him around about 300 milligrams. Okay, so I'm going to go kind of average of that. 300 milligrams is then for this 100 mg per mil, going to be 3 cc's. We're going to start with 3 cc's of xylazine. 
I'm going to go ahead and draw up all of these drugs now because when we start the procedure, we don't want to have to be worrying about, oh, did I draw up that drug? What do I need next? Let's just get it all ready to go while we're here. Assuming three cc's is going to be enough for him, I'm going to follow that up with six cc's of ketamine. Now remember, if that is not enough for him, when we give him the xylazine, if he's not quite sleepy enough for us that we need to give him more, then please don't forget you need to also give more of the ketamine at that point too. Always keep your ketamine dose doubled whatever of the xylazine you gave to get your desired effect. So I'm just going to start with six cc's of ketamine. For him, I'm going to add a half a cc of torbugesic. I'm also going to go ahead and draw up my lidocaine so I have that ready to roll. He's out there talking to us. He knows what's coming. I'm going to go ahead and draw up six cc's of lidocaine. I'm going to be giving him three cc's per testicle. Again, I've sort of gauged this based on the size of his testicles. In your minis, in your babies, I'm probably only, you know, size of testicle, you're not going to have to give three cc's per testicle at that point in time. Again, I know he's current on tetanus. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to have my technician go ahead and draw up penicillin so we can get this procedure going a little bit faster. So we are choosing a location for Diego today. We have a nice indoor location. We're clean, we're flat, um, pretty well free of flies. If we weren't, we'd have him fly sprayed, have some fans going. We have a great location here today. We can do this out in the field. We'll show you that here soon. If you're out in the field, look for a flat space, look for a clean space. So my injections are gonna be intravenous. Obviously, I wanna look here at his jugular furrow. I'm gonna go ahead and hold off. He's got nice short hair so we can almost see where that jugular vein is gonna lie right there. I'm gonna let go, watch this area collapse. See that collapse? I'm gonna hold that vein off again, milk it up a little bit, Make sure you know where you're going. I'm going to let up, watch it go down. There you go. That's where that vein is. That jugular vein is deeper than a normal horse, okay? The skin is a lot thicker than normal horse. I also know he's an adult. He's had a few fights. His skin's going to be a little bit thicker. I was going to use a 22 needle. I think I'm going to jump over to a 20 gauge. I'm going to use a 20 gauge one inch. Obviously, my goal is to do this right the first time, so he has to be poked more than once. He's a nice boy. I don't want to hurt him. I want to take this jugular furrow on his neck, break it up into thirds. I'm aiming for the second third. The upper third, that jugular vein, lies very close to the carotid artery. I do not want to hit the carotid artery today. Second third is perfect. Third third, bottom third, if you will, that jugular vein is a little bit deeper. You have less risk of hitting the carotid, but also as that jugular goes into the thoracic inlet, it's a little bit deeper and harder to hit. I'm gonna aim right here for the second third of his neck. And he says, get this show on the road, lady. So I'm gonna go ahead and milk that vein. We might do a little dancing. Here's the thing with donkeys. Less pressure, the better on these guys. If you start putting too much pressure on them, they are definitely fighters. Again, we talked about that stress reaction. They are different from horses. Horses you can kind of correct a little bit. Donkeys don't like correction. They'd rather leave you. I went ahead and gave him that xylazine dose. We're going to give him a few moments to rest and get going with that drug. Let that soak in. We're going to see how that 300 milligrams did for him. It's not going to take very long. He's a curious little dude. We're going to hang out with him. We're going to let him get sleepy, see how that dose did. While he's getting sleepy, we're going to go ahead and talk about some other equipment that we have for him today. Definitely, we're going to need a rope. I'll show you a nice knot for that rope to tie. We do need a bowline knot. It's going to be your best knot to use. He's getting nice. Look at these ears. Getting nice and sleepy. We're also going to have a pillow for his head, not only because it's nice to do 
but we do worry about uh, hitting that facial nerve. That facial nerve is going to be right through here. Don't forget that. Same as a horse. I don't want any pressure on that facial nerve causing any kind of paralysis while he's laying down. We also have a blanket we can lay out. Um, for, that's okay. Protect the sterile field a little bit. Um, we have a towel. We're going to protect his eyes. You're going to see all that in action, but now is a nice time to get it ready and be thinking about it. Let me show you this rope. I have a nice, long, standard, nothing fancy rope here. There are several ways to tie a bowline knot. I'm going to show you the easiest one. We can go back and discuss this later if we need to. Long end, short end. Throw a little loop in your long end. Here you go, ready? The rabbit comes out of the hole. The rabbit goes around the tree, and then the rabbit goes back in the hole. Cinch that guy down. You've got yourself a nice bowline knot. We can do that again, but don't forget, the rabbit comes out of the hole, goes around the tree, goes back in the hole. He's doing great. See this head dropping down? You don't know this, I'm actually holding him up. I'm gonna get off of him and he's gonna stumble. Okay, I was actually holding him up for you so we can show you how sleepy he's getting. For a moment, I'm gonna let my handler hold both my ropes. This is a perfect time right now to give him a second dose. Three cc's was perfect for him of the ketamine. I'm gonna give him six cc's, I'm sorry, three cc's of the xylazine. I'm gonna give him six cc's of the ketamine with a half cc of torbugesic. So, totally normal for him to be wobbly. All I'm gonna ask is my handler just to kind of stabilize him a little bit so I can go ahead and find that vein one more time. It's in the same spot. It didn't go anywhere in that jugular furrow. I'm gonna let go, watch that vein collapse. Now what's happened, his blood pressure is a little bit decreased because of that. Be aware of that. Okay, blood in my syringe. I'm gonna give him that dose. This dose is going to lay him down. I'm gonna take the ropes from my handler. We're gonna lay him down. He might dance on me a little bit, and that's okay. Because I am right-handed, I prefer to lay him down on his left side. <laughs> Do what's comfortable for you. I'm just gonna suggest, if you're right-handed, to lay them on their left side. It's not impossible to do another way. Just let's make it easier for ourselves. He's getting sleepy. I'm gonna just kind of let him do his thing for a minute and then I'm gonna try and guide him. I'm gonna try and keep him off the camera. Let me see if I can get him over here a little bit. Cameraman, you might wanna scooch out of the way and come on the other side of me. Uh, your wife may also wanna scooch out of the way. So what's happened here? Jeremy, come on in and help me roll him over. Go ahead and grab his tail, Jeremy, and let's roll his butt the other way. So he's trying to lay on the wrong side, and that's okay. All we do is we tell him, you got to be on the other side, sir. That's it, just like that. Now we're going to get that pillow underneath his head. So we're going to protect that facial nerve. Jeremy's competent doing that for me. He's going to protect that nerve. He's also going to lay a towel over his eyes. Now, this rope. This rope is going to protect me from getting kicked in the noggin. We don't want to do that. Around that upper back leg, that's why you have that bowline on his neck. I'm going to cinch this leg up nice and tight so this thing doesn't try and come back and kick me while we're doing our procedure. I'm going to go over it again. So I've got two loops around that hoof. And I'm going to go ahead and throw two half hitches. Two loops around, two half hitches, ought to keep me from getting kicked. So you can see he's with us, he's breathing, he's actually a little bit alert. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open this gate just to make sure I have somebody that can put some pressure on his neck if he tries to leave. Might be Jeremy, might be someone else that you have with you. We're gonna lay this blanket down, give ourselves a little bit of a sterile field. 
well, not sterile, but clean-er. I'm gonna take that bucket from you. Thank you. And I need that syringe of lidocaine, please. Okay, I am not doing a full out surgical scrub. Don't forget that I have chlorhexidine solution in my bucket. I'm gonna go ahead and clean him down a bit with this chlorhexidine solution. Two very prominent testicles here. Lidocaine. I can feel the spermatic cord. I'm gonna try and aim my lidocaine down towards that spermatic cord. I've got three cc's in this testicle. Filling this one, I'm filling the cord. I'm gonna try and aim for it. Three cc's in that testicle. Let's get rid of that. Clean up one more time. Okay, he is ready to be castrated. I'm gonna get my sterile gloves and let Jeremy help me hold those out of here a little bit. A little tricky to put gloves on when your hands are wet, so we just do a little field drying off. So we're gonna talk about open castrations versus closed castrations. I prefer to do all of my equines and especially all of my donkeys on an open castration procedure, which means we're not only opening the scrotum, we're also opening the vaginal tunic. I prefer to do the bottom testicle first. My preference in that is because when I have any blood flow or fluids, I want them away from my sterile field. If I did the top testicle first, I'd have blood down here. Okay, so I've opened the scrotum. I'm gonna open the vaginal tunic. Yes, this is sometimes a little bit bloody. We're gonna fix that in a minute. Okay, here's testicle proper. Here's vaginal tunic. I'm opening vaginal tunic, exposing this guy right here. Really important, we're gonna discuss that guy when we get done. All I'm gonna do, I've got spermatic cord, I've got ductus deferens, I've got cremaster, cremaster muscle. Here, I'm gonna just break this down. That's just the vaginal tunic. I'm just breaking the vaginal tunic down. I've got testicle and I've got epididymis. I'm gonna go ahead and use that car malt that I have We'll place that car malt right down here and cramp that whole spermatic cord. Blood already stopped for the most part. Time for the emasculators. Nut to nut. Sounds funny. There's the nut. This is the nut. Do not get this backwards. I can explain you why in just a moment. We're going to make that nice and tight. At this point, I need Jeremy to come back behind me. He has a very important role to play for me right now. He needs to hold that right there for me. There's just a little bit of tension on that spermatic cord, not much, but I'm gonna slide my car malt down the cord a little bit. Jeremy's gonna hold that right there so we can see what's going on. I'm gonna grab my Vicryl. I don't even need a needle on my Vicryl. All I need is the thread. I like Olsen Hagers. I don't want to worry about, can you please just put a knee on his neck? Just put one knee. Yeah, perfect, right there. Okay, here we go. I choose to do one encircling ligature on each spermatic cord. I choose to use a Miller's knot. This is gonna be really hard to see. If you need help with the Miller's knot, we can show that later. Hard to see purple thread on the gray-skinned guy, but trust me, this is a Miller's knot. Makes a nice little W in there for us. We're gonna crimp that down. The Miller's knot, as you know, is a nice self-tightening knot. I've got that nice and tight. Just because I like peace of mind, I'm gonna go ahead and throw a square knot on top of that Miller's knot, just because I can. Nice and tight. Okay, I'm gonna cut that short. Now my Vicryl is off. We're gonna go ahead and lay that down while we open up the second scrotum. Opened up the scrotum. Let's open up the vaginal tunic. A Little bit of bleeding. Oh, 
epididymis. I'm going to break down this vaginal tunic. Break down that vaginal tunic right there. Okay, now I've got the testicle and the epididymis. I'm going to grab my second car malt. I'm going to go ahead and put the second car malt down on the spermatic cord. I'm going to clean this site up just a little bit. Ideally, how long do you leave emasculators on for? If you go by the textbook, you're going to leave emasculators on for two minutes and then one minute for every year of his age. He's five years old. We got two minutes standard. Five minutes for one year of his age, he's five years old. Technically about seven minutes. Honestly, I think we don't need to leave it on that long. I'm confident in the encircling ligature that I have there. So we're just gonna leave this on for about a minute. Really important about this epididymis. If you've heard some of the old timers talk about this, this is actually the squealer. So if you've heard of a proud cut horse, you can also have a proud cut donkey. This squealer does not produce sperm. This produces testosterone. If you leave this in the animal, you will have a proud cut animal. He will still act like a stud. He will act like a jack because he's producing testosterone the whole time. Get this out so you don't have a problem with that. Go ahead and rinse off my emasculators. I'm gonna put this back on. Really careful not to get his skin in there. Nut to nut on my emasculators. We're gonna crimp that down. Get rid of that. Jeremy's gonna hold that for me while we slide these caramels down a little bit to give me some room in my crush to tie it off with Vicryl. Got my Vicryl out of my bucket. Go ahead and use my needle holders to help me out with my roundabout here. Around one time, around two times. He says, I'm almost ready to get up, lady, but you're not, sir. Have people ask me, well, how long does that sedative last? I say, hopefully long enough. We're gonna tighten this down really tight. Nice, secure, encircling ligature. We're gonna go ahead and put another square knot on top of that. Cut our tails. This is again an absorbable suture. Thank you, Jeremy, you can let go. Go ahead and grab me the penicillin if you don't mind. We're gonna clean things up a little bit. Again, I'm gonna leave that scrotum open. I want that to drain. We're gonna go ahead and give this just a moment on that emasculator. While we get him some penicillin, he says, I think I'm ready. I'm just gonna put that there for a minute. Let's go ahead and take off this emasculator. You're gonna see a nice crimp and crush on that spermatic cord right there. We're gonna take off this bottom. There will be a little bit of bleeding associated, but there should not be much like that. I like it. Let's take that off. Let's look at this. A little bit of bleeding is normal. I like it. Let's take that off. Let's go ahead and grab the wound solution. We're gonna put some wound solution into each scrotum. I'm gonna open up this scrotum, both sides. Let me go ahead and put some wound solution into both of them. Perfect, perfect. Leave these scrotums open to drain. Some people give them a little tug. I don't think we need a tug. I think that's a nice open scrotum right there. We're just gonna let that go. I'm gonna go ahead and give him his penicillin. This muscle right here I'm going after is the semimembranosus. You can also use the semitendinosus. Needle directly in, draw back, no blood. I'm gonna give him about oh, 15 cc's or so per site. I'm gonna come out and redirect. Not out through the skin, just out through the muscle. Redirect my needle, draw back. No blood. Go ahead and inject a few more. That's a lot for him. I'm gonna go ahead and come out, not out of the skin, redirect in the muscle, come back in, draw back, no capillary bleeding. Let's give him the rest of it. Now, I'm gonna take this out. There may be some capillary bleeding from the skin. Not bad. Okay, we're gonna back everything off. I'm gonna let him have his leg. Now in horses, 
when I do this procedure. Go ahead, stay there just for a moment for me. A little bit of pressure. She's got pressure right here on the muscle of his neck, not down here. Down here is his cervical vertebrae. We want to protect that and keep that comfortable. She's got pressure just right on the meat of his neck up by the nuchal ligament. If he decides he wants to get up, sometimes a little bit of pressure on that neck will just discourage him enough that they don't really want to. But I always, place? I'm sorry, Am I in a bad place? not at all, okay. not yet. Jeremy, why don't you go ahead and come help? Why don't you let Jeremy take that okay. position really quick? Sorry. Sorry. He just thinks he's ready to roll. Not quite ready, not quite ready to roll. That's okay. That is about perfect anesthesia time. We don't need him down under these drugs any longer than we need. I'm gonna give him his leg back gently. Okay, in horses, I will take this opportunity to remove their wolf teeth if they have any. Most companion donkeys are not gonna be used for riding. Most companion donkeys will not have a bit in their mouth. So I'm not really worried about wolf teeth in donkeys. So, he thinks he's ready to go. He's not quite. So, we're just gonna let him rest here. I've got his lead rope out in a safe distance that I can grab that if I need to. You might eventually wanna move your tripod though, just in case. So, he's in a comfortable position. He's quiet, he's sleeping. We're just gonna clean up some more stuff around him. I'm gonna have Jeremy actually close that gate so we don't need that gate open behind you anymore. Again, let's look at these testicles for a minute. Oh my God, I'm a little messy. Testicle proper, tail of the epididymis. Really easy. Look, all it's attached by is this little band of tissue right there. If you're not careful, that little band of tissue can tear right off. See that, how easy that is? And this will get sucked back into the body. That's bad, that means it creates more testosterone probably for the rest of his life. And you, yes, you've cast, there's no sperm left, but you've got testosterone left. You're not gonna decrease any aggressive behaviors. If they're sexual aggressive behaviors, you're not gonna change any mounting problems because you still have that left in. Make sure you get that little guy. Both testicles. We've got that little squealer, which is the uh, tail of the epididymis. So we're gonna clean all this up out of the way. Now the longer he stays asleep for us, the better I like that. The longer he stays asleep, his blood pressure is a little bit lower, so that'll help him clot at that surgery site a little bit more. Um, that'll keep him quieter. I'm gonna have Jeremy go ahead and check his eyes, check his gums, make sure he's doing okay. At this point, you can also check his pulse. You can have a stethoscope, obviously, and check it right at the cardiac level. You can also, right down here, underneath his mandible, you can feel a pulse right there. He is doing fantastic. We're gonna peek at his eye. Nice, quiet eye. He does not have any nystagmus right now. You can see his eye is nice and quiet, not going back and forth. it has got a good little blink reflex for me right there. But I'd like him to stay quiet a little bit more So we're gonna start the recovery process with Diego. He rolled himself up a little bit, and that's fantastic. I've just told him that he's not quite ready to get all the way up just yet. So I'm just gonna let him stay in this sternal recumbency position right here until he kind of gets his bearings about him. He gets the pins and needles out of his legs. He um, stops the bed spins he maybe have and let him relax a little bit. I'm not putting a lot of pressure on him. I could if I needed to. I don't need to right now. He's doing fine just relaxing right here with me. In a few minutes here when he's ready, I'll help him get to his feet. Just for a second, we're gonna let him sit here and think about life. We're gonna discuss post-operative things. There will definitely be a little bit of bleeding at the surgery site. Dripping blood, a um, little bit of drips, a little bit of ooze, totally normal. I don't want actual bleeding from the surgery site. I don't want a ligature to come loose, that kind of thing. When he stands up, he might actually pass a little bit of a blood clot, might be the size of a pancake, completely normal. He is gonna have a little bit of oozing. Again, I left that scrotum open on purpose. I want those fluids to drain out of there nicely for him. He will 
have some swelling. Uh, five years old, he's going to have more swelling than, say, a, a two-year-old or a yearling would. So it's totally okay to give him some fetal butazone as an anti-inflammatory. Some doctors prefer to use banamine. Totally fine, whatever your preference is. My preference would be but. Um, really important to explain to your owners at this stage that he, right now, has enough live active sperm to cover one breeding one time for the next three days. Really important to know that. Also really important to know that he's got enough testosterone in his bloodstream to still make him act a little bit steady, if you will, for the next six to eight weeks. Really important. He stays away from um, any of the genets, any mares. We do not want any sexual activity for the next two weeks. We don't want any blood clots to loosen up. We don't want him to, um, I guess, overexert himself in the healing process. I think he's getting about ready. I'm gonna tell him that it's okay to get up. All I'm gonna do that by, I'm just gonna let him pick up this back leg or that front leg that's laying back here a little bit. So I've got him nice and stable. I'm holding him. I'm just gonna let him get to his feet. Again, get those pins and needles out of his legs a little bit. If I needed to, I would keep hold of his head and I would have my assistant on his tail um, just to keep him from wobbling and stumbling too much. We don't need that. He's totally fine right now. How you doing, Diego? He says, what happened? We made life better for you. You don't have to worry about that sexual aggression. You don't have to worry about trying to make any babies. You can just worry about having a nice, calm life. Nice, well-fulfilled, healthy life. Let's go look at a surgery site. Let's look at any bleeding that may have occurred since he stood up. You know what, we are perfect. We have a little bit of dripping. Now I wish my wound solution wasn't red colored because we have a little bit of red from the wound solution. But honestly, you see the scrotum looks great. No bleeding from either of the surgery sites. He's fantastic at this stage. I would feel very comfortable with removing his lead rope, removing the obstacles from him, and just letting him chill out. The longer he stands there and just thinks about life, the better off his blood pressure will stay nice and low. Good healing time, good clotting time. This was a fantastic, successful jack castration. This is exactly what we wanted to show you to make this a successful outcome for any procedures that you need to do at your own practices. Okay, this is a much more normal setting that most of us are going to be in outside. Um, we're going to look for a level area as best as possible, as free from obstacles as we possibly can. This is very realistic. This is Olaf, our eight-year-old standard. A um, little bit more low pressure. Again, don't forget this is not a small horse. This is a donkey that doesn't like a lot of pressure. So we're going to see a much more normal donkey procedure out in the open, a little bit excited, not so sure he really wants to be castrated today. Well, let's see. What do you think we might you have to find a post. Up? Sometimes you have to find a post to put rope them around. Sometimes you have to find, find sometimes you got to find a corner to put their booty in. Now, I haven't even done it yet, but he says, I don't like needles, and I know what you're doing. Sometimes, when donkeys are not treated very nice, they know what you're doing, and they don't really like it all that much. Okay. I think this is gonna be fine, this three cc's. I'm gonna go ahead and step out, and I'm going to grab my next dose, which is my six cc's of ketamine with a half cc of torbugesic. I'm gonna get that ready. Let's see if we can put that rope and that bowline over him. Okay, you can see this is normal. He's swatting at flies. He's kind of getting impatient. He still is sleepy enough that we're gonna go ahead and proceed. He says, I still don't like needles, lady. So Jeremy's gonna have to hold him a little bit for me. 
Okay, this is very much real world. Olaf says, I don't want to play this game. So you're out in the field. What can you do? You can very easily do a makeshift like squeeze shoot apparatus. We've got two panels and we've got a post. Two panels and a post, you can pretty much make yourself a little squeeze shoot. If we just had a post, if you have a tree, you can loop him around the tree. You can see that even once we stop the anxiety, that xylazine is still working. I'm not going to give him a bunch more. I was kind of debating how much to give him. I've got 200 milligrams in my syringe. Let's just see here. He says, I really don't like those needles, lady. Yeah, he's just got to make you wonder what's happened to Mr. Olaf in his life. Because he's popping me out of his vein. So unfortunately, I, oh, Olaf. I'm gonna actually use a smaller gauge needle and see if that doesn't make him a little more comfortable. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump down to a 22 gauge and just see if that won't help. I know he says, no, it's not gonna help because I don't like any of it. Okay, commit the stick, get that in there. Olaf, you tricky dude. He says, I have done this rodeo a couple of times. happening is he is just popping me out of that vein. So we're going to back off and see if that was enough. Okay, so that was another 200 milligrams of xylazine. It is starting to take effect. Olaf is going to be one we're really going to monitor during anesthesia. He's either going to completely crash out and be comfortable, or he's going to try and fight us the entire time. I kind of feel like Olaf is a fighter. So that's just going to be someone is going to have to really be on his neck and be watching him. Um, while I have an assistant helping me with the surgical procedure, I need a good assistant with me to keep on his neck too. Um, if you only have one assistant, let's say you don't have any assistants, you have an owner. An owner can certainly, you can teach an owner to keep pressure with their knee right here on his neck, keep off of his cervical spine here, but you've got nuchal ligament and you've got some muscle you can use. Your owner can certainly put some pressure with their knee right in this area, try and keep him held down for you. If he really wants to leave and take off, just get some more ketamine and save yourself and save Olaf the hassle and the fight. Yeah, I see you kicking, buddy. A lot of these things can be done um, with just the owner and yourself. We're kind of showing you gold standard but Mr. Olaf is a little bit real world. And sometimes you have to modify your technique as you go. I'm gonna just scooch him over a smidgen. My concern that I'm having and thinking about right now is that I have had to inject a needle into this vein several times and I'm hoping that I haven't created either a hematoma or any scarring in that vein that I'll still be able to get a clean stick when we're ready for the ketamine. I think Olaf is about as ready as he is ever going to be for his second injection. I'm just going to look. He's going to get mad that I'm going to look. He's going to say, you've already done that, and I don't like it. Yep, he says, you've already done that, and I didn't like it the first three times. Okay, so I'm just kind of pulsing this vein. I'm kind of watching it. I don't know if you can see that or not. Looks like still a pretty good vein. I don't have a lot of hematoma formation on it. Still trying to stay in my second, third of this jugular furrow. So we're gonna do a little different with him. I'm not gonna take him off the post. We've tried that before, that didn't work so well. So this time, we're gonna keep him on this post. I'm gonna go ahead and give him his ketamine, and then I'm gonna take him off the post, try and finagle our way out of this. If we can, if we can't, hey, we just punt, not a big deal. End result is what's safe for him. Mr. Olaf, what do you think? 
Actually, I'm going to just start with a smaller needle that I hopefully have in my pocket. Fresh, clean needle. Hopefully make this a nice, smooth injection for him. Okay, Mr. Olaf, let's just make this one time, okay? I know, he says, I just don't like it. I understand you don't. I don't like that somebody's been not so nice to you. Okay, ketamine is in. Let's go ahead and take him off the post. I've got that. What do you think, Mr. Olaf? He says, I'm going to lay down for you. I got you, buddy. I gotcha, I gotcha, I know I gotcha. I know, I know, I know. Let's get you a pillow and a blanket. Let's get you protected. Get a blanket over his eye. So Jeremy's gonna stay on his neck. Olaf's got a lot of fight in there. He's a good man. Don't forget, so important, enough sperm that he can cover one mare one time for the next three days, enough testosterone to have sexual tendencies for the next six to eight weeks. Now here's the kicker in a guy as old as Olaf, eight year old, is that he may now have behavioral sexual tendencies. I've got him, yep. So we're gonna tell him, Olaf, you think you're ready, buddy. So nice and smooth. I know, I know, nice and smooth. Olaf. Okay, you know what? You're not ready, so you're just gonna chill out for a minute. There you go. There you go. There you go. See? You're on your way to a better life. You just have to have a little bit of trust. There you go, buddy. Now, I am gonna totally push Olaf's patience button and try and find that fly spray again while he's still a little bit sleepy. If we couldn't find it. Because I know the flies are going to think he is quite tasty and he is going to be sleepy, so he's not going to be able to shoo the flies off as well as he would be able to normally. He's got an open scrotal incision, has a little bit of blood. I want the flies away from that. There is a product called Catron, C A T R O N. That is a nice fly spray. At our clinic, we call it the Magic Foaming Purple Fly Spray. You can use that not in a wound, but you can use it on and around a wound very safely. He does have a little bit more bleeding. Again, if you know the difference between Diego and Olaf, Diego stayed down a little bit more, so that blood pressure was down a little bit more. You can imagine Olaf's blood pressure is just about sky high right now. So, higher blood pressure, um, shorter duration of recovery is going to create a little bit more dripping of blood. That amount is totally fine. Again, it's more of a dripping. If it was like bleeding out, I might get a little more concerned. If at any point in time Olaf chooses to relax a little bit, that blood pressure will relax, that bleeding will stop. But that is a normal amount of bleeding. Again, he's going to swell. You can use uh, Butte, you can use Banamine, another nice thing for swelling. Today, he needs to be quiet. He can stay in this small pen away from other animals. Tomorrow, he can have a little bit of hand walking. Um, the next day, you can kick him out into a pasture by himself. I don't want him with other girls. I don't want him fighting, but he can get some exercise, get walking around. That'll decrease the swelling also. So there was two jack castrations. We had Mr. Diego, who was a nice, quiet, mellow guy that we were fortunate enough to do outdoor, indoors in a nice, clean area. We had Mr. Olaf, who unfortunately didn't trust a whole lot, but we still were able to give him a satisfactory surgery, a satisfactory recovery time, and he will be much happier here at Long Hopes without having the... Uh, sexual aggressions and tendencies that we would have as an intact jack. He's totally fine. I'm going to give him a little bit more grace of his head, see if he'll stand nicely and not try and run away from us. 
If he can stand nicely and quietly, I'm gonna take this lead rope off and walk away and see if he'll just relax for us. Here's Diego on the outside. Here's Olaf on the inside. Notice Olaf has substantially decreased to almost stop the bleeding. We're gonna let these guys say hi for a minute and then I'm gonna push Diego away. I just want to show you how well Diego is doing. Totally recovered, totally fine. These boys will have aggression, will have um, some tendencies because of that testosterone in their system for six to eight weeks. They may have that behavior a little bit longer. So if he gets too rambunctious, we're gonna let him, he's gonna say out of the camera again. You're a good man. Now let's look at, let's look at Olaf. Olaf's bleeding has 98% improved, I'm gonna say, and we've been watching him for about the past five minutes. He's doing great. Diego's already trying to talk to his friends. This is why we keep them separated. If Diego was out there with them, he would be causing a ruckus and he would be harming his surgery site with too much activity. You have to keep these boys separated while they're in the healing process. This is why we do castrations in jacks. We want them to have nice, happy, long lives without all these sexual aggressions, without all these concerns about the girls. He will relax. Such a good thing for a castration. Don't be afraid to do a castration on a jack donkey. Yes, they are not small horses. They do have differences. We're hoping we've put this together for you to help you have a successful procedure to understand the differences between a donkey and a horse, to know there are differences. You can overcome those differences. You can give these donkeys a nice, happy, long life without the worry of all these sexual complications.